I call the honourable member Catherine Delahunty. Tenakwe, Mr. Delahunty. Tenakwe, Mr. Speaker. Tenakoto to Fadi Paramata. Um, this bill is a consistent continuation of government policy. It's a plan to further privatise the governance of tertiary institutions, reform the Teachers' Council without the support of teachers, and continue to create the two tiers and lowering of standards for schools such as charters versus those others in the state sector. Therefore, the Green Party will not be supporting this bill. There are, there are useful elements in it in small parts of the bill, but the overall thrust is depressing. Now, my colleague will take a later call on the, the debacle in the tertiary sector, the, the reduction of democracy and the increasing of ministerial powers over tertiary gov governance. And I do agree with Grant Robertson that this is an out-of-date, uh, backward-looking, failed management theory which many people have abandoned. And the inclusion and broadness and representation are how we all, we all know better decisions are made. So we, we will, one of my colleagues will expand on that in her later call. But I'd like to make some general comments about the overall direction of the bill. And the over, overall direction is not only the national government's policy, but also it's part of an international process we're seeing which has afflicted the education sector. Education's always been a politicised and deeply debated space. But now it's an eroded space in this country where concepts like education for lifelong learning and educators as the conscience of society are being minimised and marginalised by the overarching and de depressing determination that education is mainly a business. From early childhood to the tertiary and education sector, it's been carved up for profit and the compulsory sector is being redefined from the perspective of business efficiency and standardisation. So I'd like to talk about a parent who I met with today who said to me that at their five-year-old had been kept in at lunchtime to improve their spelling because the school was worried about meeting national standards. That is a very, very depressing experience for a parent. And another teacher who told me that she was forced in her classroom to put up a picture of where every child was at in relation to national standards. So those who were failing, supposedly, and those who were achieving. If that's what we call expert teaching, that is a tragedy. And this teacher, who's a remarkably good teacher, is destroyed by the introduction of competition and the exposure of so-called achievement for five-year-olds, six-year-olds and seven-year-olds in her classroom. That's what I'm talking about, Minister, not that you want to hear it, not that she wishes to hear it. There is endless rhetoric in the educational space about meeting student needs and creating outcomes and fulfilling potential for all. We can all buy into that. But when we read the clauses of this bill, it's pretty clear that this is about advancing changes that will fulfil a very different power shift. The reform of the Teachers' Council was heralded with some excitement. Teachers expressed interest in the idea of a professional body that was by teachers for teachers. They were interested in a model, Mr Speaker, that would regulate and represent them as professionals, just as medical professionals have their own professional bodies. However, things started to go badly awry when the transition chair of this process, John Morris, put out a series of papers advocating right-wing educational solutions such as performance-based pay through the New Zealand Initiative when he was supposedly leading a neutral process of developing the new Education Council. The See No Evil government saw no conflict of interest in his behaviour, but the teachers' organisations smelt a big rat because performance pay is divisive, inefficient, destructive and irrelevant to student wellbeing. And that should have had no place in the discussion around the development of the new Education Council. However, it was deeply, it was deeply conflicting that the transition chair actually focused on that and politicised that process. Now we see the enabling of legislation, but we don't see the robust involvement of the broader teachers teaching sector representing the concept of public quality education. The Education Council is described in the Act as, quote, to provide leadership to teachers and direction for the education profession, as well as a number of other new roles and responsibilities. So who got these roles and how they are developed is a critical process and should not have been a politicised situation. It should have been an inclusive and depoliticised situation. 
I guess the new bill couldn't let the new Education Council be a teacher-led professional body because then all of the provisions of this Education Act that undermine accountability, safety and transparency in the charter schools would have become an even greater contradiction. The Green Party sees no need to abandon the limited authority to teach as an important adjunct to the essential role of the registered teacher. Because that idea, the limited authority to teach, was always based on the idea that these were people who were studying towards educational qualification, but also, also were contributing to classroom. The bill sets up all kinds of structures, which we don't disagree with, to protect children, to regulate teacher registration, and to establish a code of conduct. Note, not a code of ethics, but a code of conduct. But it's extraordinary that these are not applied in other parts of the Education Act to the unregistered teaching staff in charter schools, who will also be working with the same range of students who are not covered by the Education Council rules. They will have police checks, but so should all volunteers. They might be fabulous and they might be a risk, but lowering standards seems to be the underlying contradiction alongside double standards. On one hand, teachers are meant to be professional leaders who get $350 million spent on their career pathways towards executive principle. And on the other, in the charters, the targeting of the so-called vulnerable students, the staff don't have to be a teacher and are not covered by the codes of conduct or accountability rules in the new Education Council. So it's all about tightening up the rules for teachers but totally relaxing them for others, and that is a massive contradiction. All students deserve an education that is liberating, innovative and inspiring. And of course, I agree they are not all getting that now. I have visited the people working on charter schools, some who are clearly motivated by the best reasons, and some who are just downright inappropriate in their ability to meet targets. The Green Party fails to see how the vanguard style, press-ups and military training punishment model is going to create the best modern learning environment. It's not the pedagogy of collaborative learning that we all believe in. And it's the pedagogy of authoritarian control. And it was very interesting when the uh, professor from Oregon University talked in this, in this parliament not long ago about how the authoritarian model, which appears to work in Asia to create great peace standards but doesn't lead to innovative thinking, is welcomed by Western societies who don't know how to manage kids without an authoritarian model. And he said our biggest challenge was creativity. And in fact, the Chinese government, for example, and the Singaporeans are recognising that that is not working to create past pass the test standardised teaching and, and, and standards, national standards for those countries are not creating innovative learners who can lead a modern world. So it was really interesting to hear him speak and the Minister says it's not true but he was, he was a fantastically creative person who has been employed by the Chinese government for that very reason. For that very reason, the Green Party is very keen to work for solutions for the genuine initiatives to become part of quality public education in Aotearoa that is culturally appropriate and innovative. This can happen, but we don't need to privatise. We don't need for-profit, state-funded, um, unaccountable schools to do that. Now, much of this bill is detail and and stuff that I'd like to read in more detail around international students and, and private training associations and teacher registration. Many of it may well be useful. We often find these omnibus bills combine things that are good with things that are actually abhorrent and then put us in a difficult position because we can't support them. And we will be looking for the greater good in the bill if it's there. But the overall approach towards the tertiary governance issues, towards the Education Council are very disturbing and we, we find it difficult when our inboxes are now being flooded by people who are very concerned about this bill and do not believe there are enough good things in it to justify Order. it. It is difficult to imagine how less democracy and less teacher involvement in their own professional body will result in better decision making. And Stephen Joyce talks about for example, cutting students out, but it'll be a choice. People can choose to cut students out. What he's not, he's failing to acknowledge is that democracy needs to be encouraged, supported and acknowledged in law so that people recognise the importance of those diverse voices rather than the myth, the order, myth of efficiency. Order, order, order. I have been contemplating, sorry to interrupt, remember, I've been contemplating for some time. There was a, a long-standing convention in the House 
goes back to the time of Sir Basil Arthur, 1984, Speaker's Ruling 63 bar 1, that when members are in close proximity to each other and there's inter constant interjections going on, it actually has an effect on the microphone. So I just ask the member, please, to desist. I call the Honourable Member Catherine Delahunty. Thank you, Mr Speaker. An education amendment bill is an opportunity to strengthen democracy in education, and unfortunately this bill fails to do that. Thank you very much. I call the Honourable Member Cam Calder. 